So, oh, for the A through, yeah, I think it's uh, I'm not first. So. Maybe if you want to, we're waiting on Dasha. You want to announce it? Oh, Dasha, straight there. Dasha, Dasha, Dasha. Is this after you? Do you remember? Patrick, too. Patrick, get up. Go ahead, come on down. Well, Rango, no. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome into day three. If you are one of the presenters for either of the breakout groups, you may want to go ahead and come on down because these go pretty fast. If you're online, bear with us for just a second. We're having trouble getting control of the room. All of these unruly students. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm serious now. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you remember, we start the day's agenda with, thank you. We start the day's agenda with the breakout recaps from the day before. Um, and uh, I know some folks have been confused about how we've been handling the breakout uh, uh, reports in the past. A lot of you have been breakout leaders at this point, so I don't think that's going to continue to be true. Uh, but they, the leaders have sort of self-organized the responses from all of your groups under four different headings, starting with takeaways and what we learned from the keynotes, any key concerns or impediments to doing this research that have come up how those concerns translate into new questions or opportunities for us to study, and then the kind of actions that we need to take going forward. So you'll hear about these four set headings from each of the two previous sessions from yesterday. So we're gonna go ahead and start with session 3A, which was all about uh, permanence. So Dasha, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we've been asked to share um, you know, our general impression from how the group discussion went and what was different or what was expected and expected, and then kind of incorporate these points in our uh, reflection. So I should mention that I think the the outcomes from the group discussion uh, was largely defined by the makeup of the group. Uh, and you know that we are so interdisciplinary group here with com comprising of scientists, um, policymakers, stakeholders, um, uh, NGOs. So I found that was quite interesting how the discussion was weird towards one area or the other, depending on uh, who's been on a group. And I think we started at the same time, uh, we ended up noticing a lot of commonalities uh, within the discussion, which I think is a good sign because uh, makes me believe we're on, uh, we are on, oh, all on the same page. Um, so we all started with definitions of permanence and how that differs depending on the um, MCDR approach. And then, you know, 
uh, then the discussion we are going to perhaps uh, instead of using permanence, we should use durability, which is less ambiguous and uh, is more nuan nuanced and uh, implies a spectrum rather than not binary, like permanent or not permanent. With durability term, we can define whether it's you know, durable for 100 years, 1,000 years, 3,000 years, and that can have implications for uh, for the buyers of carbon credits. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the discussion also um, kind of revolved around the roles that academia, government, and, and private companies have in this realm. How do they interact with each other? Um, what are the roles at the beginning of the MCDR? Uh, as we just kick, kicking off this topic and how this balance of who is doing what changes over time as the MCDR uh, become uh, an operational or more common and redefines the roles of different players in this realm. And I think uh, the last part, which uh, mostly reflective of the scientific communities that we um, agreed that in current state modelers and um, observationalists are not working together enough. We would like to be more integrated. And um, MCDR presents this opportunity to us because we will have to work together in order to make the reliable and, and high quality MRVs for the MCDRs. And I'll hand over to Patrick. Hi, my name is Patrick Duke. I'm a PhD student at the University of Victoria. And I think a lot of these are going to overlap. And I'll try to emphasize the ones that came out in our breakout discussion that uh, almost every breakout group tried to touch on or at least touched on a little bit. So the first one we talked about was spatial and temporal decoupling of capture, uh, carbon capture at the project level, and then sequestration and leakage sort of as this project evolves. Uh, and the importance of permanence monitoring happening at a different scale than sequestration. Do we need to use different tools to approach these two different things? How do these tools sort of integrate at each sort of in each project and then across each basin? And then another thing that came up really early, actually, in our discussion group, uh, Katya mentioned, uh, should we be modeling things we cannot measure? And I think this came up in almost every group. Uh, and I think catch it actually wasn't really a question. It was more of a statement uh, that we shouldn't be modeling things that we can't measure. Uh, we need observations sort of on the ground to help improve and actually verify these models. So we can't be like over-reliant or over-dependent on any one sort of tool here, especially the modeling component as we get these projects ramping up. Uh, models also show an aggregate, not individual effects. So if we have sort of multiple projects happening across each base, and I think Tyler, you may be, this is sort of building on the question that you asked the audience uh, yesterday morning as well. Uh, how do you sort of parse the net effect between each one of these projects and actually sort of create a market around each one of those projects, attributing to drawdown and carbon sequestration to each individual component? And then another thing, baselines, I think everybody's touched on this a little bit. Where are we with baselines? How are we establishing baselines? What do these baselines look like? Uh, and who's sort of dependent on actually creating and defining these baselines uh, across different sort of spatial and temporal scales? And then how can we match the timescales of industry versus academia? I think this came up again in the sort of the key points. And then this was across almost all of the discussion groups. There seems to be a disconnect in sort of pace and objectives in both of these sort of groups. So bringing that sort of mismatch uh, being aware of it and bringing it up and sort of addressing it is pretty important. Uh, but how does it matter if models, uh, it doesn't matter if models can ch help choose sites if they can't do this fast enough. So this needs to be sort of a spectrum and we need to work across, sort of across the aisle to find a middle ground here uh, in this sort of disconnect between industry and academia and actually the deliverables that we're looking for and also supporting each other. And I think creating that sort of responsibility of who is owed sort of what uh, as this sort of scales is, is really important. Okay. Can you hear me okay through this? All right, awesome. Um, so I'm Meg Estapa at the University of Maine. And 
um, I'm reporting out on the synthesis of the different 3A breakout groups, um, ideas about the key questions and opportunities that we are uh, having to, uh, that we need to address as we move forward in this. Um, so um, there were sort of some fundamental uh, questions, I think, that came out from multiple groups. Um, and and sort of one of these is uh, about the, I'm actually going to go to the bottom bullet first, but the uh, accuracy and precision that we need to achieve when we're talking about durability of CDR. Um, does it matter if it's over a thousand years? Like, what are our standards there? So that's sort of a, a key question that um, we need to address, I think, across uh, industry and academia. Um, another uh, key question is whether the requirements for MRV need to be the same when you're in pilot project or R&D mode versus once these projects scale up, if they scale up into um, operational mode to be much larger. So that's another key one I think that we are, are all facing here. Um, there's also questions that are kind of opportunities um, in terms of, of our scientific understanding of these systems, and those are sprinkled out throughout these bullets as well. Um, so for instance, um, the global carbon budget isn't closed, right? So there's sort of a key scientific uncertainty there. Um, and this uh, this is maybe a challenge as well for our, our prior section that this is uh, preventing from us from establishing a clear baseline. Um, there's still open questions about the functioning of the ocean's biological carbon pump. Um, and, um, and then there's also mechanisms that are occurring at the sediment water interface that are not well characterized. And so all of these questions um, we need to address as we move forward with these, these operations. Um, and at the same time, keeping in mind that when we start to perturb all of these systems, we may be changing it. And so the models that we're gonna use um, may also need to change, right, to reflect that. So um, these are, are questions and also opportunities, I think, to better understand the systems that we're working in. Um, and then sort of generally, um, the need to work across multiple scales and address uh, different objectives at those different scales, different goals for groups that are working uh, at these different scales is an opportunity. Um, um, and uh, finally, you know, being able to conduct these proofs of concept um, modeling studies, something that uh, presents an opportunity, I think, as well. Um, so my part here. So <clears throat> what do we do? We have all of these open questions. We have all of these thorny issues that we're not really sure how to resolve. What do we do about it? We know that just given the fact that these um, uh, proof of concept studies are already happening, we know that we need to use the tools that we currently have to try and assess some of these thorny problems, even though we know we're gonna be bad at it at the beginning. So it's important to get started. So what can models and observations that we have now give us in terms of insight into the durability of CDR? We need to start defining that now. Um, you know, and as we start building towards, again, this idea that the MRV strategies that we develop now may be different in the future, we need to keep in mind that, you know, they need to be possible, they need to be cost effective, they need to be um, uh, easily adopted, right, because we're going to need multiple parties to be conducting MRV over time, um, and allow for that evolution to happen. So again, the point is to get started now, figure out how and why we're bad at it, and then continue to improve in the future. And there's a couple of things that we talked about that may actually make that more possible. First of it, those is a registry of sites where field testing is happening. If you're doing a demonstration product, invite us to partner with you. Um, we want to be able to develop our sets of skills and our sets of tools to help you conduct MRV in those areas. Um, on top of that, the data from that field testing, we need it for model validation. <laughs> um, you know, uh, 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 it's really important that we have the opportunity again to hone the way that uh, these processes are represented in our models. Um, and then, you know, overall to use those partnerships as diplomacy, like we want to be able to build towards operational CDR together to meet our climate goals, to pre prevent loss, damage, and death that comes from climate change, right? Um, 
and so really gathering the community and engaging in these kind of community building activities is going to be essential um, for those kinds of diplomatic partnerships. Uh, I also have been working with the virtual groups uh, in the space um, all week long. And one of the things that we really came up with, um, or, or one of the activities that we worked on, was essentially this graph that you see here of how do we get started? How do we apply some of these ideas? And we essentially have some kind of readiness level. No, it was poorly defined. I acknowledge that. Um, Time is on the x-axis. No, I don't know what the time scale is. I left the years off on purpose so that it would be poorly defined. Um, and the idea is that, okay, so we've talked about all of these different actions we need to take. What order do those have to go in? Um, so, you know, again, forming communities of practice and, you know, establishing a code of conduct, those are the kinds of things that come first. And as you can see, there's a lot of research in field simulations and stuff like that that we have to do before we can develop um, MRV standards, which is somewhere here in the middle, uh, before we can develop, you know, a set of standards for what MRV should even look like in best practice. And of course, that is far in advance of developing things like compliance market standards that will continue um, uh, to develop over time. Um, so uh, that was session 3A in assessing permanence. Yeah, session 3B, you guys are up. Hi, I'm Nicola Wiseman from the University of California, Irvine, um, and we're going to be talking about the Session 3B prompt, which was all sort of focused on sea air flux um, and talking about modeling and measurement in terms of sort of planning what is our way forward from here. So um, I'm going to start off with just our takeaways and learnings. Um, one of the really big things that we all sort of agreed upon within our, our groups was that Scaling a project from sort of regional to global scale is essential. We have to sort of start small with some of these sort of pilot projects and work our way up from there. Um, and that sort of matching the scale of MRV from the scale of intervention to the scale of flux needs to occur. Um, so, you know, when we're, when we're talking about um, sort of the, the, the impact of, in, of intervention that we want to have, there needs to be sort of movement between these levels uh, of scale. Um, and this applies not just to sort of field studies, but to models as well. Um, we need to be able to look at sort of the fine scale and move our way up. Um, and that our, our models need to be based on something. And it was said, if you put garbage in, you'll get garbage out. Um, so having these sort of baseline studies, like was just mentioned in, in group three, uh, 3A, is really going to be important um, if we're going to start, you know, going forward from here and, and scaling up and um, going from there. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everybody. Will from Planetary. Um, feels a little bit uh, painfully obvious what we've got here for concerns and impediments and obviously a, a very short list compared to what we actually have. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate sort of ditto to everything Jess just said in the last, to wrap up the last session, I thought that was brilliant. And I think we can learn a lot from that. But we did also do some work in 3B. Um, so yeah, uh, highly dynamic areas are, are going to be really difficult to measure. And so, you know, we've been looking at a lot of global scale um, things and we have to continue down that path. But obviously, when it comes to studying these, these very localized areas, um, that's going to be a concern. Uh, everybody's concerned about money. Uh, doesn't matter what uh, what lane you're in. The scale of investment required is going to be challenging. Um, and I I don't know. I feel like it all harkens back to that idea of working together. Um, that that's going to be critical. The money can only take you so far, but the partnerships we make in this room um, will allow that money to stretch a lot further. Um, did anyone else know that quantifying alkalinity is challenging? Um, <laughs> uh, but I think we're making good strides towards that, and I think um, I think we can overcome uh, overcome that with technology and, and um, understanding what the bar is and how to how to how to get over it. I thought it was a really interesting uh, topic that didn't come out of my group specifically about this idea of the, um, the not only the cost of um, 
of modeling for people's time, but the um, the computational expenses, and I guess, did I understand this wrong, that there's even like a CO2, there's like a LCA piece to really giant computers that churn out big models. Um, that's, I think that's an interesting thing to, uh, sorry, a uh, life cycle analysis. So if you're doing your accounting on all the carbon um, that you're, your process uh, removes, there's actually a, a term that might be needed if you have a giant model. Not something I had thought about before, but very interesting um, thing to consider. Uh, not that those those accountings are hard enough already. Um, that's all my bullets. I, I guess I'll see the form. But yeah, thanks everybody. Hi, I'm uh, Adam Sabash from Woods Hole Oceanographic. I'm going to talk about key questions and opportunities from uh, 3B. So um, I think you know one one of the things that we ended up talking about is you know the question of do, do we care and do we need to measure and model inventories of carbon, or do we care and need to measure and model the fluxes of carbon um, between various boxes and this kind of also comes down to how we're defining reservoirs and um, uh, where this carbon or um, alkalinity or kelp ends up. Um, uh, so putting some constraints on that, I think um, might be helpful to kind of shape uh, what we do with models um, and what we do for accounting. Um, so, and, and in that, you know, kind of incorporating this accounting framework into the model package development, I think um, uh, we, we kind of saw as um, something that, that might be needed moving forward. Um, you know, uh, let's say that we don't care about the CO2 flux. Um, maybe all we really need to do is in a kind of combined ocean atmosphere box, just consider a leakage term uh, from that surface ocean into the deep and say that's X percent of the alkalinity or kelp or whatever. And then you just assume the rest equilibrates and that's an efficiency term. Um, and you don't even have to worry about measuring your sea flux. Um, uh, the other thing maybe we could do, um, it's an open question, uh, really focus the measurements uh, and uh, on a really localized area around the point source and then kind of let the models do the rest. I think this is in a little bit of tension with um, Katya's point earlier about, do we have to measure the things that we're modeling or not? Um, uh, so something for us to think about. Um, and finally, um, you know, this role of proxy measurements and proxy sites. So, um, you know, really what this is gonna be is uh, we're, we're going to need a large number of field trials and a large number of sites um, to really start understanding um, the interaction of physics and biogeochemistry. Um, and there's going to be a lot of value that's going to come out of the aggregate of these experiments um, that we may not actually even see until um, we kind of take a step back and, and see the whole thing. So um, something to think about. And, um, you know, uh, there's this proof of concept uh, idea that, you know, if you do it at a small scale, you actually may not be able to constrain it as well as a larger scale experiment, just because the perturbation is going to be really small. It's going to be really hard to see. Um, so there's some balance there too, between starting small, building up to something big to the point where you can actually really fully um, constrain the system. Um, so, you know, how we do that, how we ramp that up um, and get to that point where we can really, you know, do the whole package, I think is some, uh, something for us to consider. Um, all right, action is next. Hi, everyone. Dave Koic, Ocean Visions here. Um, so the good news is that, uh, you know, we were able to figure out exactly how to solve all these, exactly how to solve all these problems. And so just listen up and we'll be able to be able to do that. Um, one thing that a number of the breakout uh, rooms converged on, which I thought was really interesting, is this constraint around personnel and personnel training and what can be learned from industry, how can um, academia adopt 
uh, better practices around um, model development, model maintenance, software engineering, sort of the ability of multiple people to easily use multiple models. I think a lot of people were thinking about that in terms of transparency, right? Like it's one thing to post your model code on GitHub. It's another thing to make it easier for other people to use your model. So we spent a long time talking about that, you know, um, Galen was in my breakout room and, you know, she mentioned, look, it's re every modeler would love to have a software engineer on staff and it's just really hard to do that. Uh, and it's really hard to retain those people and prevent them from going to other places where they can get really large salaries. And so, you know, just as a community thinking about what needs to be done um, so that personnel does not become the constraint on innovation here. Um, so we talked a lot about you know, trying uh, to think about ways to codify best practices, um, thinking about training, internships, et cetera, ways to enhance or accelerate technology transfer, and then communities of practice that um, institutionalize or memorialize knowledge so that, uh, you know, the process of training people does not become a five-year process of a student sitting next to a professor, and then when that person goes off and graduates, that information is lost, and you need to rinse and repeat. So, you know, how do we eliminate that uh, as being a constraint or a bottleneck to scaling? That's it. Welcome to session four. Oh, yeah, go for it. Question from Hetty Edmonds at NSF. Will, can, <laughs> yeah, the question from Hetty was, uh, can you clarify about why it's difficult to measure alkalinity uh, and is the point that we need in situ sensors? I love how I'm the one answering this question. Um, I mean, I open the floor to people without microphones, but I think in-situ in sensors are certainly part of it. Um, we learned a little bit about a few opportunities for sensors yesterday. And I think part of it is also what, maybe what is the level of precision required um, that goes along with the sensor technology. Um, but I, I welcome other input because I'm out of my depths here for that question. Chris Hunt, University of New Hampshire. Um, one of the issues maybe that would tie into that topic is potentially unknown analytes within the definition of total alkalinity. Um, some people call it organic alkalinity, but there may be compounds that we're not doing a good job of understanding that are contributing to that measurement. So that might be something that Hetty is referring to as well. Yeah, Chris, that's a good point. I wanna jump in to say that uh, understanding how we're even gonna sample alkalinity, filtering, poisoning, what have you in certain areas uh, is an open, is a question that still not everybody's on the same page about, so. Uh, Tyler Searnack, Georgia Southern. So I think our ability to measure alkalinity to precision and accuracy is, not improvable too much right like so our bottle sampling ability is really good and the thing that sensors will allow us to do is to increase our spatial and temporal sampling which is really critical in dynamic ecosystems so i think um, that's really important to think about yes Yeah, I'll just say, um, and I don't know how many people on the industry side know this, but um, the reason that we can measure alkalinity, NDIC, and pH to such a high degree of accuracy and precision is because of a really amazing standardization effort by Andrew Dixon's lab. And that community standard is largely sort of personally done, just out, really out of the goodness of his heart, I think, um, for the community. Um, I don't think it makes a whole lot of money um, for him, uh, but uh, we we are going to need that to continue um, in a really big way um, 
if we as a community want to see high quality carbonate system measurements moving forward. So that's just a plug for, I think that's all to think about um, maintaining really good uh, standards, seawater standards for the, uh, these measurements. Are they active? NIST is taking it over. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to move on to session four now. Envir MRV and an environmental. And there'll be a timer here for you. Yep. So. Must have become such a Zoom pro. <laughs> <laughs> all right oh, thanks right um okay all right so we continue with session four um let me this up a little bit and um first of all good morning everyone and um my name is leonard bach i'm from the university of tasmania and um i'm really glad to be here it's been a great pleasure to organize this with all the fantastic people who are involved and um, um, well, I think, I hope that, that in 10 years, when we look back and have been massively successful on all this, that we look back at this workshop and see it as, yeah, it was one of those initial ones where it all, it all came together and created momentum. I think it can be that kind of workshop. Okay, so, um, so moving on to, to, to the presentation I'm giving now is, uh, well, the title is, as you can see, Additionality as the guiding principle for monitoring, reporting, and verification. And yeah, um, well, additionality was uh, is a parameter. I mean, most of all of us are probably um, aware of this parameter. I think it's not get receiving enough attention at this point. I think this is really the absolutely central parameter we have to to deal with, and at least me, it helped massively to uh, well investigate all these different uh, MCDR methods. So just to give everyone a bit of a refresher, perhaps, um, what is additionality? Well, it, the first prominent appearance I am aware of uh, was in the Kyoto Protocol, but back in the days it was still considered in the context of emission reduction. So in the Kyoto Protocol, um, it's defined as an action that leads to more emission reduction than no action. So if you have um, an emitter and you do nothing, that emission may change over time or it may not change over time, but you don't actually regulate it. But then if you implement some some well action um, then you change the emission and additionality really is the difference in these two scenarios so the baseline uh, versus the uh, the no action scenario versus the action scenario now in the co2 removal space we use it quite similarly but with um, well reference to co2 removal and here it is defined as uh, well the implementation of a cdr method leads to more carbon sequestration than no action. So a simple example, we have our pasture. We do nothing, the, the pasture may or may not change its capacity as a carbon sink, um, but we could convert the pasture into a forest. And then the, the actually relevant parameter we're interested in, additionality, is the difference between the baseline, so the business as usual state, and the new state. Um, we can very easily convert this into some very simple mathematical equation. So we can say carbon sequestration, the additional carbon sequestration, so the thing we are interested in, 
is uh, the carbon sequestration from a CDR method minus the carbon sequestration from the baseline scenario. And obviously we were talking a lot so far about carbon sequestration and MRV from the CDR method. So I wanna take the opportunity to talk more about the baseline because I think when we look at this equation, it quite immediately becomes clear that we're not looking at a problem where we have to determine one flux, but we also have, to, well, we have to determine two fluxes. So in order to get to one number, we have to do basically two carbon budgets, one that is the new one and one that is the baseline one, the old one to calculate additional carbon sequestration. And I'm starting with a couple of examples. So in the context of ocean afforestation, or you can call it, it has multiple names. So you can call it seaweed farming for carbon sequestration. So basically what I mean is adding um, kelp to the open ocean. Um, what that really is, um, it's not a, really a new carbon sink. It's a modification scheme of an existing carbon sink, right? So you have the biological carbon pump that is already operational in the oceans, but ocean afforestation it, um, seeks to enhance the efficiency of that, of that approach. So it um, tries to make an existi the existing biological carbon pump more efficient. And from our biogeochemical foundational knowledge, we know, we know um, that this can be achieved by exporting more carbon per limiting resource. And in the ocean, um, mostly nutrients or light are limiting resources depending on, on the location. Now looking at the baseline scenario, so if we go to our simple equation and we first, the first thing we, in order to MRV this whole approach is to know what the baseline is, right? So um, ocean forestation has several ways, uh, sorry, uh, the biological carbon pump has several pools and fluxes that became, become relevant in this context. So we have particulate organic carbon from phytoplankton, dissolved organic carbon from phytoplankton and carbon export that are um, essentially carbon sinks. So, well, pools and fluxes that sequester CO2 in one way or the other. And then we also have particulate inorganic carbon. So that is basically calcification. That's a small carbon source also because some plankton calcifies and they generate CO2 by reducing alkalinity. So this is our baseline scenario. Now um, for additionality, what, uh, so for our forestation, what, what's happening is that we, we exchange the existing carbon six of phytoplankton, we exchange it with new biological players, so kelp. So we divert the limiting resource that is currently limiting the biological carbon pump from one driver to the other one. So in this case, we divert it from phytoplankton to kelp. So we have two um, con concurrent systems and both uh, more or less do the same thing. Now, what we have to do in order to MRV this approach, um, we have to make these two carbon budgets. So we need to um, know all the pools and fluxes for both of them in order to get to the result that we're interested in, which is this C add term. And this is like the, the simple math, the simple equation there and all the individual components in the equations below. Now, um, of course, you got to ask the question, where do we stand? And um, just only looking at the biological carbon pump, what we know about carbon export on a, on a global level is that, well, our best, well, estimates are that we are somewhere between um, five to 12 gigatons carbon per year of, of carbon export, right? So this is the range of, of uh, um, that's the range we only have in this parameter. So in order to, to, um, to calculate additionality, we must get significantly better in, 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 in these and other pools and fluxes to, in, in order to be able to, to calculate additionality. And then, of course, what we have to ask ourselves immediately is, well, is this going to be realistic? So I, I put this out as a, as a question. Is it possible to reduce uncertainties to a satisfactory level when attempting a comprehensive carbon budget. And it's not like oceanographers have not attempted to do these kind of carbon budgets. It's not like that we're lazy, but we're just, I don't know, did you say that, David? Yeah, it's not, yeah, we, we've tried it and um, yeah, don't know how successful we were. 
So I think in in this in this in this context, we also have to start really early about thinking um, within the time frame we need to achieve this. Is this realistic, and are we actually uh, are there more achievable ways to to get to a, a satisfactory MRV scheme? And one one just one idea, I think that is way more promising is a stoichiometric approach where we calculate additionality based on the difference between uh, for example, carbon to nitrogen or car general, more generally carbon to nutrient ratios, because if we apply our fundamental biogeochemical knowledge and assume as in our textbook knowledge from Samiento and Gruber's book and saying that um, biological carbon pump efficiency is essentially uh, limited by, um, for example, in the, in the Atlantic by nitrogen, then we can say, okay, we have additionality if the if the seaweed sequester more carbon with the limiting amount of nutrients, in this case, nitrogen. So we basically have to look at the C2N ratios and compare them to the plankton communities. And I think that is, there's a lot of uncertainty still, but I think it's more achievable. And I think what needs to be done is in an environmental context, we need to have better schemes or more. We have to look at this differently just than talking about fluxes, which I think is a dead end road. Just briefly touching on that, um, iron fertilization runs into similar problems in general. Um, here, um, additionality has been addressed to some extent, in, in, but not, I think, not very in a concentrated effort, but more like generally. So we, we're talking about nutrient robbing so that nutrients that are used at one place are not available downstream. And therefore we, re we enhance productivity here, but reduce it on another place. And therefore we get not necessarily a net gain. Um, and we have also talked about secondary feedbacks like through um, uh, and to O production and these things. What I haven't seen, and I wonder if it's necessary to think about that is that if we add iron to the oceans at a certain specific location, do we actually have to quantify the flux that occurred before? Because now we occupy the space with iron fertilization. So do we have to minus off the flux that would have occurred in the absence of iron fertilization? And again, this, this makes it way more challenging because we not only have to quantify the fluxes from, an, from ocean iron fertilization, which we've been struggling really hard with, but we also have that baseline that we uh, have to, uh, where we have to do well, quantify fluxes before we even start, right? The third example um, uh, is alkalinity enhancement. And I think the situa situation here is quite a, quite a lot better. And that is because our baseline is, is not perfect, but it's better constrained than the baseline for biological methods. So because we have been um, cruising around in the oceans for quite a while, and we can measure alkalinity with relatively high precision. We have a good overview of how alkalinity is. And thanks to the inertia of the geological cycle, alkalinity is relatively stable. So that works in our favor in this case, this inertia. So we have a relatively good understanding how the baseline looks. Um, and perhaps even more important is that the baseline is probably less likely to be affected by the implementation itself. So when we talk about ocean forestation, we always have the issue of this nutrient or resource reallocation. So the baseline is changed by the action. But here we can say that um, the baseline may not necessarily, or is perhaps less likely to be changed by the action. So if I have a baseline level of alkalinity and I add plus 20 micromoles per kilogram, then this is probably not interfering with the, with the level alkalinity was before we even started. So that significantly simplifies our calculation because that feedback is, ab is absent to some extent. It's not entirely absent because getting a bit more specific now, perhaps not so important, but just saying that, of course, if you overdose alkalinity, you induce feedbacks that affect then the baseline. Again, so here the, the trick is be moderate and therefore avoid this risk. But I, I would say that's, it's a bit easier to control because we don't have that. We, yeah, if, we, if we're not overdosed, we, we won't run in, into it. Whereas no matter what you do, if you add kelp, you divert nutrients, you divert resources. So you cannot avoid that. Okay, of course, it's not that simple. And in, in this case, I was just talking about 
So this idealized scenario is just the assumption that we have a very clean source of alkalinity. So we only manipulate alkalinity. Reality is many, many approaches uh, actually use an alkalinity feedstock that is not that clean. So when you do alkalinity enhancement, it often comes with other substances such as iron. So you always, or not always, but in many approaches, you have the problem that you do um, you do alkalinity enhancement plus some other um, actions such as iron, fertili uh, iron fertilization. And then of course, all these other issues related to iron fertilization come into the mix which you have to deal with. Now a bit of a switch in, um, uh, in the topic. So one, one question that I've been, well, nervous about. Um, so when we talk about additionality or, or, or MRV, so far we mostly looked at the carbon side of things. So we put on our carbon goggles and, and look at the problem uh, through them. So what we, we're talking about is this, which is, of course, the most important factor with respect to radiative forcing in the climate system. But if you look down the list, so this is some figure from the IPCC report, and it's not even all, there's not even all the components on that affect radiative forcing, but you can see there's a lot of parameters in the Earth system that, uh, that, that alter radiative forcing. So the question I was having is, do we actually have to MRV additionality based on a radiative forcing? Uh, basis right so that we just convert it to that and of course that means that there's way more parameters in the mix you'd have to consider but i i think it's necessary because ultimately we're not this is not a solely a carbon removal mission this is a climate mitigation mission so if our carbon removal is very effective but it's very influential on all these other parameters it's it will it will be really hard to mrv it and i just brought this example in because I thought like many of us came via plane, certainly I did. And um, we always talked about our carbon footprint, right? But I mean, shouldn't we talk about our contrail footprint in this context because contrails are, well, the uncertainty is large, but approximately twice as influential on radiative forcing, right? Um, now, when we do that, so if we convert or if we move on from, MRVing carbon towards MRVing radiative forcing, then of course we have to consider way more factors. So, for example, in the context of iron fertilization, this was done to some extent. So there were, were papers about the N2O feedback zone so because um, suboxic microenvironments generate and have capacity to generate N2O, which could offset the benefits from carbon removal to some extent. BMS production in the far south could perhaps enhance cloud albedo and all these things. So direct albedo effects could also come into play. So if we have to do that, it's gonna be, it's gonna be way harder. Um, yeah, so, uh, so how to approach this? Um, I, had, uh, I had, had the opportunity to, uh, to work on, on a little bit of an idea with these people and it was really uh, uh, very, like for me, it was great. Um, so Naomi Vaughan, Phil Williamson, and Cliff Law. And so we tried to, okay, how, how can we approach this mess? Um, so the goal is, of course, to remove carbon. Um, sorry, what? Um, okay, no. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm starting it ready. Um, so what we, what we thought and even within this group this was highly controversial so feel free to smash everything I'm say I'm saying now um, but I think upon the design of or, yeah upon the design of, uh, of MCDR method so when we start uh, talking about it and when we start like a startup that's thinking okay what can I do I think one one question they have to to uh, get into like get into is um, the potential for known or unknown unknown so what what potential there is of the applied method to mess around, right? So, and, and this is probably gonna be controversial. So um, consider this scenario. So we have a method that is relatively like straightforward with respect to complexity. So the cleanest version of alkalinity source. So you have maybe um, sodium hydroxide and you add it. And in this case, the goal 
is to mess around with nothing, only carbonic chemistry, right? So you, you change chemistry to generate CDRs. It's relatively straightforward. Of course, you have the potential to induce side effects because that alkalinity and the associated changes in carbon chemistry may affect biology, which then can induce feedbacks and so on. But it's, I would, I would argue, it's relatively little potential to induce known or unknown unknowns. Now consider the next case, ocean iron fertilization. Here, we manipulate chemistry, which then is supposed to manipulate ocean biology and the ocean biology is supposed to generate CDR. Here, there are more, there's more potential because there's more complexity in, in the approach to, um, to mess around in ways that we don't know yet, right? And a third example, perhaps the most extreme one is artificial upwelling. Here, we manipulate ocean physics, which then are supposed to, gener uh, to manipulate, in order to manipulate ocean chemistry, and ocean chemistry is then supposed to manipulate ocean biology to generate CDR. So basically, we manip manipulate the entire ocean system to generate CDR. And on all these various components we manipulate and the, the, the side effects they can induce, there is a massive potential for known or unknown unknowns. So I'd argue that, the, that um, uh, artificial upwelling is by far the hardest to MRV. And um, so there were some recent, uh, recent developments in order to, to get um, behind that. And we have all heard Freya's talk about the carbon plan uh, approach, which I found really compelling. So their approach was to rank, uh, please correct me if I'm saying it incorrectly, to rank CDR methods based on remaining uncertainty, which is really helpful because it provides some sort of quality control on what is, uh, yeah, what is, what is where we have far advanced and, you know, where's, where, we, where we're not. Um, I think it, but I think it doesn't go far enough, perhaps, as for now. I think what needs to be implemented is also this potential for unknown unknowns, because at the moment, it's just based on presently available knowledge, but we need to have this foresighting in order to uh, anticipate, hey, where is there actually a large potential for, for inducing changes we can't control, right? So I, I would encourage to kind of get this into the mix as well. And this is based on this, on this uh, concept of com complexity. Um, uh, to conclude, um, three, bullet, three bullet points. Um, the first one is more, I, I pose it as a question. And I wonder if MRV built on carbon budgets is a dead end road. Um, MRV, um, I think MRV should extend to the earth system and not only on the carbon cycle because ultimately we want to reduce radiative forcing. That's what we need to do. And I think we need to consider these known or unknown unknowns when designing MCDR methods. And with that, I want to thank you for listening. But one tiny announcement, we're coming up with that um, best practice guide for ocean acidification, sorry, ocean alkalinity enhancement research. This is just a picture from the old one just to show where, the, where this is going. And if you want to uh, contribute some of these, get in contact with me. Thank you. for question okay yeah we have time for a question maybe before we start the panel discussion yeah yeah doc i don't know um, is to mrv here doug i'm coming <laughs> so, sorry yeah uh, so doc asked if uh mrv is actually a verb to mrv i don't know i i just thought it's it makes my language way less complicated so i just used it as such in the, uh, I like the idea, simplify this down, but when you looked at this five to 12 gigatons per year for the biological impact, we talked about that uncertainty, that's a global number. Yeah. You do not need to concern that any better to understand the impact of a regional or local activity such as adding iron. And you showed that later on, right? And in fact, that's exactly what we did and what's been done several times 
we looked at the control site, we looked at the difference from where we added iron, we compared those fluxes at a given depth, and that was done along with the other radiative force heat gases. So we, we've done some of these things. I just like, you set this out almost like this hasn't been done, but in fact, it was done. And it was done to the extent that we could quantify for one ton of iron, we got a thousand tons of carbon leaving a certain depth. We had nitrous oxide production, but again, everything you said is correct, but we can do this. I'm just not as pessimistic that we need to know the five to 12 number to answer the global carbon budget. Yeah. Never gonna know that. <laughs> but are you happy with the, with the uncertainty you're achieving? Like, do you think that the certainty you were reaching is sufficiently good? Yeah, we could tell the difference. Yes, within the accuracy and uncertainty of the methods, you could see a significant difference. Not at every study, it wasn't actually the intent to get that number very well, but I think we can do much better and we showed we could do it. We know from natural studies of natural iron systems, how well we can do that also. Yeah. So we can put bounds on that. The unknown unknowns, uh, we can start waving our arms and coming up with other things uh, since I have the mic. Uh, it, to me, it doesn't seem to <laughs> be necessary, you know, if it comes directly from chemistry or physics or biology, all of those things are going to have un unknown unknowns and whether the carbon is coming up as a chemical shift or physics and chemistry and biology. I'm not sure that criteria tells me what's where it's more likely. That's the whole thing about unknown unknown. You could shift the chemistry and alkalinity and have as big a unknown unknown effect as if you did physical forcing anyway. I might add, uh, Patrick Rafter here, that uh, isotopes can also help us with uh, <laughs> changes in carbon export and nutrient uptake. Uh, David Ho, University of Hawaii. I'm wondering about this MRV of the Earth system thing and whether that's LCA and not MRV, you know, some of, some of the terms. Well, uh, life cycle assessment or analysis. Okay, but if it is LCA, um, should that does it mean it's not content of this of this workshop? Or is it like uh, yeah? <laughs> no, no. I... No, that that's not what I mean. But I, I'm wondering if because LCA should be done right, and I'm wondering if some of those things are not already considered in LCA. Can I follow up on that? I mean, I think that is a semantic question that might be considered through the lens of which communities need to come together to assemble the necessary knowledge to address the question. I think you can very easily imagine, you know, an N2O signal being well within the purview of this particular community or a change in the albedo, you know, induced by a macroalgae farm being well within the purview. So whether it's LCA or MRV seems kind of an irrelevant distinction in the context of what knowledge needs to be assembled. Hi, this is Jamie Poulter. Um, a, a little light bulb went off for me is that we're, we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel here. There's a, the concept of CO2 equivalence um, for emissions. Um, could be this concept of CO2 equivalence for removals. This is integrated over time for a transparent time scale. Some people use 25 years, some people use 100 years. That would incorporate the leakage factor and the durability problem. And um, if there's an N2O outgassing or al uh, albedo might be a bit harder, but you can also use its radiative impact integrated over the same time frame, and it gets subtracted from your removal. So maybe that is a useful concept to apply in this, for CDR, just as it is for emissions. I don't know if anyone's doing that now. Agreed, but that means you have to measure way more than carbon. Yeah. That's the point. Or measure or at least um, bound its uncertainty. So it's part of that error bar. Yeah. Shall we, shall we start the panel discussion maybe? So all the panelists come down. Oh, okay. So this um, panel is uh, 
okay, Mar Fernandez Mendez is online, and we have yeah. Doug Wallace and Adam Subas here um, as part of our panel, and very excited for that. And they've all been extremely um, disciplined in not doing slides, so we can start the conversation. So <laughs> after introductions, we'll set us off with some questions. So Mar, would you want to go first? Online? Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me and thank you for giving me the chance to join uh, virtually, saving a little bit of CO2 <laughs> this year. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Mar Fernandez Mendes. I lead my own research group at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven in Germany. I worked before uh, very much in the Arctic Ocean, looking at phytoplankton, primary productivity, carbon and nutrient uptake, carbon export. Then I moved to Geomar and Kiel and worked a bit on artificial upwelling. That's where I met uh, Lennart. And uh, now I'm working both on, in the Arctic Ocean and as well in the tropics. And I moved uh, a little bit from phytoplankton towards macroalgae. And so recently I co-founded and I'm the lead scientific advisor of a company called Seafields that is trying to figure out how to properly do open ocean macroalgae cultivation together with artificial upwelling. So the worst case scenario that Leonard uh, described. And in this case, we're trying to use um, sargassum for that. So no kelp, uh, just uh, floating sargassum. So yeah, happy to be here and happy to meet you all virtually. Thanks. Adam, do you want to go? Uh, great. So um, I'm Adam Sabash. I'm a uh, scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm a chemical oceanographer. Uh, I study the kind of linkage between the carbon and the alkalinity cycles in the ocean, um, thinking a lot about the, you know, processes that move um, carbon and alkalinity between the solid and the dissolved phases, um, really from a kind of process-based experimental and observational point of view. Um, uh, I'm definitely not a modeler. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, the, the other thing I, I'm working on one of the natural analogs projects, the other one that, um, Alex Gagnon is working on the, um, and I, I just want to say, I think this, my role here also is to define the scope of this discussion. Um, so we're going to be talking about ecological impacts and, uh, that can end up being a pretty, uh, broad and wide ranging discussion. And I just wanted to, we wanted to play some limits on exactly what we're talking about here. I think Lennart's talk did a pretty good job of that, but really what we're talking about is um, impacts, sort of secondary impacts that would cause a change in radiative forcing. So we're not considering impacts to fisheries, the economic benefit of restoring a coral reef to tourism, you know, any of that stuff, we're not considering those we'd consider other stakeholder um, interests. Really what we're going to focus on here in this discussion, we'd like to focus on is the, the impacts that are really affecting um, the radiative forcing budget of, of a particular method. So, um, yeah. Hi, I'm Katja Fennel from Dalhousie University. I'm a biogeochemical modeler. I also work on data assimilation, have for 20 years. Um, in terms of potential conflicts, um, I am funded. I am funded by the um, NSERC, the Canadian National Science Foundation, basically um, on an alliance grant, which um, requires industry partnerships between academics um, to work with planetary and pro oceanus on an MRV framework in uh, Bedford Basin. Planetary, you all know by now who that is. Pro Oceanus is a sensor company in Halifax. They produce PCO2 sensors. Um, yeah, and so I so I missed the beginning because I was in the bathroom. Sorry, <laughs> but um, I I can I can take two minutes to talk about sort of myself and then we go on. Is, is that fair? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. So um, it, I I mentioned already I I do biogeochemical modeling and data assimilation. And on, I do it on the regional scales. I want to sort of make a plug here for regional scale models because, um, <laughs> because it felt like yesterday the focus was very much on global scale. And so we heard from Matt and Galen. And so you can, I, I'm prepared to take your flag if, if any, any is coming there. But, um, and, and so those, those global scale models are, of course, really important for 
um, durability questions for earth system feedback questions that's the right tool that's what we need them for but um, if i think of where we are with cdr and mrv trying to get out of the gate process-based pilot studies i don't think they are the right tools i think we need high resolution regional models um, period. And so I felt that was a bit underrepresented yesterday, and I've been talking to many of you sort of informally. I'm glad to have the opportunity to say that to all of you again now. I really think that we need high resolution um, regional models and earth system models, both important um, quivers in our sort of toolbox. And that is my um, Okay. And um, one other point regarding the data assimilative um, side of the models, um, it relies critically on con uh, um, continuous data streams that are providing enough information to really constrain the processes that we want to um, that we want to study or that we're interested in in monitoring. So we we need um, this really tight coupling between observing system and and modeling. And so for the open ocean, biogeochemical Argo is a really sort of promising observing system, especially if we can get to pH and TA sensors on, on those, those platforms. I understand that the technology is a little bit out, but it's there on the horizon and it will be a complete game changer for, for modeling studies on the global and the regional scale. And then on the smaller scale, obviously we need other tools. The technology is there. It needs to be pushed a bit further, but there's amazing technology that that is ready to be used. And the modeling capabilities are there too, right? We have um, modeling communities, the expertise is there. Um, so we, we're not starting from scratch by any means. Okay, M maybe I'll stop there and hand over to you. Uh, so Doug Wallace. Uh... It's kind of handy, actually, because Katya and I, we, we share some background here. So I'm also from Dalhousie University. I'm a chemical oceanographer um, and uh, have similar uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, declarations to make there. Also working on alliance grants with planetary technologies, uh, working with Pro Oceanus and also with another company together with, uh, with Dasha, um, Dartmouth Ocean Technologies, who are developing some new in-situ sensors. Um, my um my the quiver not the quiver the 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 arrow in the quiver that i want to pull out and emphasize is something i've I believe in very strongly uh, is the importance of long term multidisciplinary time series uh, for, as the basis for understanding and i think especially in relation to lennart's uh, point about needing to know what the baseline is and uh, understanding what the variability of that baseline could be uh, we really need to base that on places where we've got good characterization of uh, episodic behavior, which the ocean is full of, um, going back some time. And if we're interested in secondary impacts, even on radiative forcing, um, only on radiative forcing, um, we also need to understand that the complexity of those impacts can be really surprising and hidden. And so again, having a multidisciplinary long-term perspective sometimes gives us clues through observations into connections that we are otherwise would not have thought about. I think there's an example actually uh, coming out of another carbon mitigation uh, issue um, uh, that's specifically the idea to use green hydrogen mixed with natural gas uh, to, uh, uh, to lower the carbon intensity of existing uh, uh, fuel systems. And, um, you know, there's always somebody who realizes that if you mix uh, hydrogen with, uh, with methane, then the, the temperature of the flame in your burner changes and you could conceivably have increased emission, for example, of nit uh, nitrogen oxides, which is something that most people involved in energy policy probably aren't aware of, hadn't thought of. It took an atmospheric chemist or two to make the connection. So those are... That's why multidisciplinary time series are valuable because it allows insights from different perspectives to be combined to address issues that might crop up that we hadn't thought about in advance. So specifically with carbon, Leonard mentioned some, I think the nitrogen cycles 
got plenty of room for surprises always. And, um, and so there, therefore the, the basis for M to MRV, we should probably try to start MRVing um, in places we all, where we already have a baseline and a, and a kind of a multidisciplinary uh, basis for un of understanding. I've got lots more to say, but that will do for now. For a little bit. Yep. So we open it up for questions to the audience and the online audience. Unless Heather is on the way. Okay, I'll get, I'll bring it to Savvy. Sure. Hey, Sav Savvy at ClearPath. Um, I had a question um, about the regional models, and I guess could you say more about why you're so passionate about it? Maybe what are some of the pros and cons versus in our system model? Um, just because I'm not personally familiar with that. Um, yeah. Uh, the, well, so the, the, the first most obvious uh, distinction is just the resolution, right? So we we are in the process of, of setting up this model for Bedford Basin where the spatial resolution is going to be um, below 80 meters. So, so 80 meters grid, grid resolution, which I think is what we need I mean, finite would be even better, right? That's what we need if we want to have an injection of alkalinity and track it. We need resolution on that scale. So the resolution of Earth system models is drastically lower, right? We don't have the computational capacity to run a global Earth system model uh, at anything near that scale. And so, so that's the that's really what it boils down to. And, and there are many ways we can actually link higher resolution models to coarser resolution models, so-called nesting, um, telescoping from the highest resolution in your region of interest out to the larger scale. And, and so th those, those tools are all there. Can I just follow up on that? This is Matt Long from NCAR. I feel like I need to defend my, <laughs> my stance. I mean, I think regional models are absolutely crucial, but I think the point that you just made about the connectivity between local, the local scale and 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 you know broader regional basin to global scale phenomenology is essential. So, you know, my my position is that we absolutely need a multi scale capacity. You know, we need to be able to drill down into local scale processes at very high resolution. You know, that's not feasible on the global scale. But then we need also to be able to connect those regional processes to the the global scale so that we can really understand the connectivity across the full domain. So I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and so I, I just thought of another um, point in favor of the regional models. Um, <laughs> and that is, it, it's just sort of um, more, more accessible. So running a global model of the scale that Matt is describing is beyond the means of most people. I mean, even my lab, is not able to run anything of the sort that Matt showed, right? That that requires a dedicated um, center like NCAR. Um, but but you know, a, a regional model is something that's very much attainable at every university, right? A, a, a PhD student can typically run it at computational resources available to them. Do you and mean that sort of applies also then to startups, right? Like a startup will not have the capability to run to, to run an Earth system model. But a regional model very much within reach, right? And there's useful stuff that we can get started with, with regional models. Like we can really push um, MRV process-based studies, pilot studies forward with regional models that are not as sophisticated as, at, at, as what Matt is doing, but, but that will give us important insights that we need right now urgently. When Getting you say out of the capacity, game. do you mean computational or? Sorry. Yeah, supercomputing, supercomputing capacity. Is yeah. there a cost association as well with that? Of course, yes. And so that will likely be more expensive with Earth system. Is that absolutely yes? Okay. Yeah. Is it? Is there like a scale of like ten x expensive or? Sorry, <laughs> I'm asking a lot of detailed questions. Um, I don't know the answer precisely, in part because I work at a institution that has a supercomputer that I have access to. And so I can just sort of blithely, you know, put a run in the machine. And, um, but I think the capital investment of, a, you know, a, a supercomputer capable of crunching through global high resolution 
models is um, is is substantial. I don't think that that's really, you know, those calculations are 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 hugely expensive. Um, whereas something, you know, something that a typical ac academic department might have as a departmental competing cluster would be able to handily support, you know, modest resolution regional models. Um, so it it's really a sort of a step function change in the capital capital cost of the computing. Can can I make another point here with this the models question and you know regional models or system models? There are also a lot of data reanalysis products that are based on models. Um, and if we're you know I'm gonna I'm, I, this is I guess my high horse I'm gonna get on at this conference. Like if we care about inventories and state estimates, then we can use a sort of model that's divorced from any sort of forward-looking time to really ask questions about variability and all this stuff and state estimates of regions at a pretty high resolution. We're going to need the data to back that up, right, and really verify how accurate these state estimates are. But those can be, those data products exist. Um, they're at pretty high resolution. They're regionally resolved. Um, and that's a really good way to start asking questions about variability and inventories and you know, how things move around in time um, that uh, is another it's 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 not a model per se but it's a model data product that I think um, we should all be thinking about can I make one one comment about the costs so um, at my NGO we've done some estimates of how much it costs so I'm going to give you some numbers here um, so to run a version of CESM that Matt was talking to, a similar version, costs about $100 per simulation year, okay? That may seem like a lot or a little. That's what it would cost on a commercial cloud provider for a one degree. If you add in something like um, a full atmosphere chemistry model like Wacom, you move up to $400 per simulation year. Now, CESM is not ROMs, and, and we haven't done this exactly with what regional model you're talking about. Um, but when you go to any sort of regional model, like a downscaling model like Wharf, very often actually the, the cost goes up a lot. So, yeah. for example, we find with with running some versions of Wharf, again, that's not ROMs. Um, depending on the resolution, you can be in, on the order of five hundred to a thousand dollars per simulation year. So, again, this is not for ROMs, but the it's not a generalizable assumption that conclusion that regional models are less expensive. It very much depends on the resolution you're running, the resolution that you're comparing it to. And I would say not it's not necessarily a bigger obstacle, but a different obstacle that's not compute cost has to do with the ease of deployment of the model on whatever your computational infrastructure is, the amount of support and maintenance that can be done for that. So all of those things are sort of built into the cost of running that. And so at a, at a university, it may be that you have already have the expertise to run a regional model and you don't have what's necessary to run a model like CESM at NCAR. Yeah, uh, Alec Wong from uh, Wissel Washington Graphic. Um, so this, uh, uh, so I'm observer. So the question goes to data gap. Okay, so I think, you know, everyone on the panel probably have a different aspect. What do we really um, lack of to be able to run uh, things like original high resolution model? What are the kind of the data gaps we don't have at this moment? Um, I mean, the global ocean, ocean you know, decadal uh, repeated hydrography is decadal changes that's, you know, done from a ship. Yesterday we got uh, limited capability of sensors time series at surface, but most of the internal of the ocean, we still rely on bottle samples. So what are the, what people think about the data gaps to be able to get the high resolution regional model so that you can link the say release experiments to the regional model to the global model? So if you wanna do data assimilation, with continuously updating um, accurate estimates of the state, the physical ocean state and the biogeochemical ocean state or, or, or the carbonate system state, um, you need continuously um, incoming spatially resolved, temporally resolved data streams 
and and we're lacking that. That's that's a gap, right? So, in terms of biogeochemical data assimilation, the data stream that has been used so far is satellite chlorophyll, and that's sort of been the only one. Then there's SOCAT, so that's also been used uh, PCO2 from SOCAT, but that's obviously not enough to constrain <laughs> constrain anything. Um, BGC Argo is is a game changer. It, it'll make it possible to actually run data assimilative global and regional models. And, and it's being, those are, so we're, we're sort of there, we'll be gearing up, right? We're, we're on, on the verge of doing it. Um, was something much smaller scale, take Bedford Basin as an example, we need a system of sensors there. We need gliders um, that give us sort of this, this data stream that we can then update during an, CDR experiment and and following, you know, following an addition of alkalinity, for example. Um, hi, Rue Nicholson, Watoll Oceanographic Institution. Just as a follow up on that point, is for biogeochemical Argo is starting to get there, and one of the main facilitators of that is the mature data system, and something that we're we are have not achieved for the coastal and near shore ocean. And um, so the development of data standards, robust data systems that, um, you know, we need real time quality control and, and the, well, depending on the application, you know, we need, we need um, the standards data quality control so that models can ingest diverse data sets now. And, and so the progress has been made, the glider community is moving in that direction. But that's not in place yet, and we need that for the model. If I, if I could just respond to that briefly, I mean, I think that's an example, and the gaps are numerous, right? I mean, I think the gaps are numerous, especially uh, in um, uh, uh, coastal and, and shelf environments. Um, take the privilege of being the oldest person on this panel. Yep. Um, to, to reflect on, on Galen's talk yesterday about where we are with the global scale um, uh, verification, let's say, of, uh, of the non-engineered uh, carbon uptake. And, um, you know, having been involved in that at the beginning, pretty much, uh, uh, and having uh, made some success, I think, you know, we did make some successes in quantifying the decadal increase in, uh, in carbon in the ocean. And but all of those programs are almost cottage industries, really. They're unfunded, as Galen mentioned, things like SOCAT that we rely on so much is not IOCCP. It's, a, it's an organization which does a lot of work, but based on volunteer uh, volunteers, um, we lack the structures, to be honest. It's not just the funding, actually. I mean, the funding would help, but I think we lack the structures to get to the grips with the scale of the problem we're, we're discussing the technical aspects of here. So in addition to the technical aspects, how we do MRV, which is difficult enough, and which is the main focus of this discussion, probably meant to be the main focus of this panel, I'd just like to mention, you know, we really have to think, do we have the structures? Do we have the practices, the way of doing science that's relevant to this issue where we have to be open about our failures as well as our successes. You know, what didn't work and publish that perhaps as well as what did. Uh, we're gonna have to be much more transparent than we have been in the past about what's good and what's not, including observations and models. And we're gonna need more people because probably most of the experts who really understand the complexity of what Leonard was talking about are either in this room or online. A lot of the, a, lot, a significant proportion of the uh, the world uh, uh, expertise is probably at this workshop or online, and uh, it's clearly not going to be enough people to tackle this, which is a, a global issue. It's not a U.S. issue, a Canadian issue, or a European issue. It's a global issue. So I just want to kind of, without going off on a too big a tangent, point out that there's the technical aspects, which are difficult enough, but we also have to have the structures and the people to implement them once we figure out how to MRV. Um, 
Claire Reimers, Oregon State University. I wanted to um, put out my opinion that I agree with Katja about the importance of the regional models. And part of that is thinking about Leonard's um, definition of uh, additionality and trying to compare states baseline versus altered. Um, he, he kind of just showed it in a 1D sense, but we know the ocean is in 3D. And I think regional models give us a better chance of, of defining boundaries um, in the air sea interface, the sediment water interface, um, uh, lateral export out of regions. And, and so again, just thinking about that complexity, I guess that's one reason I, I, I can wrap my head around regional models a little better. Maybe, what does the panel think? Go ahead. No, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree. What about you, Adam? Yes. Um, I, I, I will say that though, um, you know, from, from a physical point of view, I think it's absolutely essential that we go to regional models. And I, I, I think it's an open question for us to think about too, in terms of the, the biogeochemistry that gets implemented, you know, what are the, what are the processes that we, um, oh, okay, that, that we need to think about for, for earth system models, global scale models, and how does that map on to what we need to consider at the regional scale? Um, how do we parameter? I mean, obviously the global redfield ratio may not apply in the Bedford Basin. I don't know. Maybe your time series can answer that. Uh, right. So, so there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of these regional differences. The alkalinity to salinity ratio is not the same in the global ocean as it is in the Gulf of Maine, for instance. And so when we start thinking about how to, how to, um, uh, sort of restrict our view in this way, a lot of these global relationships start falling apart. Um, and they that that has implications both for state estimates and also for our our parameterization of fluxes in the system. So how do we parameterize carbon export in these coastal um, systems? How do we parameterize sediment fluxes in these coastal systems? Um, what are our our known unknowns? What do we do about secondary precipitation in models that both calcification, which is very poorly defined right now, and the abiotic um, side of things. I mean, Leonard had that plot in his um, in his talk about this sort of runaway feedback, but we actually we don't really have a very good handle on what the sort of seawater conditions are that would even lead to um, secondary precipitation, particulates, dissolved matter, saturation state, temperature, salinity, all these things are going to matter. And we don't have a good handle on that. And so from a process point of view, you know, I, identifying these key processes, both in terms of the ones that matter for specific uh, CDR pathways, and then how those map onto, you know, biogeochemical modules in models, both regional and global, I think is, is going to be really key moving forward. Yes, yeah, this is Jamie Paul. Oh, good, Mar. Actually, I was going to direct a question to you to make sure, well, to engage you, but also, uh, why don't you say what you're going to say now? I was just going to add that um, in terms of models, they're great, but in, from a biologist perspective and someone that goes very often to the field, and I see so many things that are not implemented in the models, and improving those parameterizations is key because. An algae of floating macroalgae like sargassum, for example, that has completely different dynamics than phytoplankton in the open ocean is not accurately represented in any model at the moment. So if we want to really use those models to make estimates about that, we need to first parameterize it properly. That's the only thing I was going to say. Actually, that was precisely the question I was going to ask. Is there some, do you use models? So currently, maybe you don't, but you would if they, and then the answer is, parameterize um, primary productivity better, Yes, so? exactly. So at the moment, we're collecting all the data to better parameterize uh, models, exactly. And next year, the modelers will start working on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, Patrick already gave the mic to someone up there. Uh, Tyler Cernak, uh, Georgia Southern. So this is going back to sort of what you started talking about, Adam, but considering all of the ocean CDR 
pathways that have been sort of proposed, what are the biogeochemical feedbacks that we really need to think about that could reduce their effectiveness? <laughs> yes, that's my answer to that. Well, I mean, you mentioned <laughs> secondary precipitation, right? Like, so, you know, when, when does that become a real problem? It reduces efficiency, but when does it become the point where it's actually doing the opposite of what we're attempting to do? I mean, in this specific case, it has to go really down in alkalinity uh, before it becomes it fully negates CDR, right? So if you have precipitation going on, you still have uh, CDR, but there's a point where this balance gets uh, really critical. And that's, I mean, when you start at an alkalinity and then you increase it and you induce secondary precipitation and you go down below that threshold where you started, you even then have CDR, right? It's an efficiency thing. It's not necessarily a problem of um, not having CDR anymore in this specific case. But a more general case, I would say the most, like from everything I did, the, the from with respect to biology, the most critical thing is the nutrient reallocation problem with everything that relates to biology. And for geochemistry, well, there's only alkalinity enhancement, really, I think so. In this case, it's all, everything that's around precipitations. If we, like, I mean, okay, of course, if you think of biological feedbacks that then induce feedbacks, right? So that's, that's way down the road. But these are the obvious ones, I, I would say. Yeah, hi, uh, Galen McKinley, Columbia and Lamont. I mean, I want to agree with the value of, of regional models. I think if we can build regional models uh, for an EMRV, that's going to be a lot better than a global model. But one of the challenges we have right now is that it's the global models that are actually available, widely available to the community, and are supported by uh, by by institutions like NCAR. And that's what's really accessible. Uh, that's the one that most people learn how to use. So this issue of infrastructure and uh, is really an important part there as well. I mean, and, and you know, we would like to improve the biogeochemistry and we can improve the biogeochemistry in our regional models, but we also need the, the manpower to work on it and to, and to do it and deal with, with all the other pieces. So a lot of the studies you see out there are based on the global models simply because those are the ones that are most available, right? And so, so I think that the, yeah, I, I think that we need to work through that and get to a place where we have models at the appropriate scale for the, there are, all models are a tool. We need to make sure we have the appropriate tools for the questions at hand. So I wanna respond to that. Um, I don't agree. I, I wanna point out that there is a very vibrant regional modeling community there are um, tools such as ROMs that are uh, supported by a very large international active engaged user community. And so they are not in this room, but they are out there. There might be some online, I don't know, but there's a big community. It, it's not just, and, and so unfortunately there seems to be, to be a bit of siloing between the earth system modeling community and the regional modeling community. So I wanna speak here on behalf of the regional community and say that we're there. We're not here in the room, except for me, um, but um, we're there and we're also publishing. We're doing important work. So I wanna push back on that view. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I, but I think that we need to, but still much of what I observe, I also run regional models, happens in the context of individual research groups. And it's really challenging to keep it keep it supported and keep it going on individual research grants, right? So if we wanna build the kind of community we're talking about here, it needs to have more like underlying support. And I need to be able to download the output of a variety of regional models and all the interesting locations and compare them. And they need to have not be, you know, one sort of goes to this location and half overlaps but doesn't overlap. Like there needs to be more integration, more comparison, more opportunity for those interactions and yeah how does it add up to the the global scale right so i think a lot of this is possible and a lot of the tools are there i completely agree but i think a lot of the issues are manpower and uh and underlying infrastructure okay can i sneak in an online question because we haven't had very many we have a ton of them coming in and i can't even keep up that's why we're keeping a google doc for this and and i would really like it if the speakers and panelists would go in and look at those questions a lot of them are 
focused on specific MCDR approaches that can be easily addressed with commentary in the document. Right now, there's a question for Leonard um, from Iria Gimenez. I know that the rules of the workshop explicitly asked us all not to triage MCDR approaches, but according to you, should we include at least, oh God, hold on a second, sorry. What happened? What happened? <laughs> oh. Deleted it. I was in the middle of it. So. Okay. Um, I know the rules of the workshop explicitly ask us all not to triage MCDR approaches, but according to you, should we include at least a bit of discussion on the potential open letter that might be produced in this workshop as to how more feasible MRV would be for different MCDR strategies. If we don't do it, seems like we're not being completely transparent. If we do, it seems like we're taking sides and favoring one strategy over the other. This one got a lot of upvotes, so I thought we should add. So, yeah. If we're so, gonna do an open letter, do we wanna provide the same perspective that you provided in your talk where you kind of went through and, and talked about the potential for one one to have more complications over another method when you had the physical, chemical, and biological. Should that be in such an open letter or in MRV recommendations to start? Uh, well, I'm inherently undiplomatic on these things. So I, I, uh, yes, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that's what I honestly believe is true, right? So I'm, 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 I may be wrong, but I currently think that there is a massive difference between MRV and biological methods relative to geochemical methods. And I think geochemical ones are easier. Um, so, well, from I, I would sign that letter, but... I mean, <laughs> there might be another letter. <laughs> if, if I can say something about this, I think, um, you know, one, one of the things that the, the NAS report didn't focus on, I mean, they focused on the costs of each method and they kind of broke that down and outlined a research strategy. But um, that's what what we're here for is something a little different, right? What, what we're here for is the, the MRV side of that equation. And I think one thing that may be missing from the NAS report that we could really contribute here is understanding what the kind of core list of of measurements that we'd have to make for each of these methods are and and start putting together like what would that cost like what what does that look like um and factor that in then because i mean what we've been talking about right is it's not just you you don't just do cdr mrv has to come along with it right at the same time you're developing your mrv strategy um uh, hand in hand with the cdr approach and if that's true then we have to factor in the costs and the monitoring costs associated with each of those methods um, and uh, having a kind of clear-eyed view of what that is for each of these approaches, um, I think might be really valuable. And that might be one way to kind of um, uh, uh, diplomatize maybe the, um, the outcome, what that letter might look like. Uh, Ma wants to comment on this. Ma. Yes, I would really like to say that even though at this stage, of course, we can already say some things about certain approaches and say other things about other approaches, very often we still lack the data to actually make proper conclusions about the feasibility of certain approaches. So I think we shouldn't run ahead ourselves and start categorizing things and putting them in boxes and what is more feasible and more whatever, because we don't really know. And, and also different approaches have been researched in different ways and from different time scales. So of course, they cannot compete with each other right now. But maybe, again, if we go back to using models to answer some of those questions, if you know the C2N ratio is not uh, represented properly in a flexible way, then you cannot really assess if artificial upwelling is going to work or not. So it's just an example. But what I'm saying is that maybe we should refrain from making very strong statements on this is way easier and this is way more difficult because it really depends on the specific approach. Um, David Ho, University of Hawaii. Um, just so Katya doesn't feel left out, I, I did say in my talk that I thought regional models were the way to go. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe this is also a, a question for Katya, but related to uh, Leonard's presentation which is, I think, very provocative. 
because if we do have to consider additionality in, in our MRV, then it, I think the only way to go about it is to model a counterfactual, right? Something that didn't happen. And in that case, we don't have data to feed into the models. And, and you are a strong advocate for having data to back up the models. So how do we go about doing that? Well, sort of at this stage where we're talking about pilots and process studies, it has to be by sequentially comparing the baseline without manipulation with manipulation. Um, that, that's, that's the way to do that. Once we get into sort of a large scale operational mode, we lose that ability. And so I don't have a, I, I don't think there, there is a way around that, right? So does that argue for certain methods for CDR if, if we want to be sure of the MRV? No, I think that's inherent to all the methods, right? I mean, the, we're talking about as we start to perturb and change the system on a large scale, we can't compare it anymore to the unperturbed system. Um, that's what we're talking about here, right? <laughs> he was saying that for OAE, it's easier. Did I, did I say that? No. Oh, he, he was saying that. Oh, oh okay. Uh, uh, do you want to answer it? Uh, um. Yeah, well, yes, I think so. That's why, like, if I if I was in a horse race and I would bet on this horse, right? But um, so maybe that also relates to to what um, to what Mar said. I I think yes, of course, we can always hide behind uncertainty, say we don't know yet, we don't know yet. But um, at some point, we ought like we have to foresee residual uncertainties at some point, right? Because there will always be uncertainty and. I'm of the opinion that some methods are linked to more uncertainty potential than others. And that's why um, I, I think there's more potential in some than in others. I'm just, I'm gonna, this is Jamie, I'm just gonna um, put in for Jessica who left her Zoom cocoon to put uh, an enthusiastic whisper that tomorrow, we're not triaging methods, but it's meant to be an interactive conversation. We are, we, we will, somehow, and Heather's going to talk more about this, um, compile ideas around like what's needed. And so, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we're going to rule something out, but if, if one thing has a list of what's needed, that's very long, that will, that's just, what's a fact and what we, what we as a community think is what's needed. And it's a judgmentless list of what we think would be a kind of minimal thing to confirm that we've had the climate impact that we hope to have. Um, and so hopefully we'll get to some of that tomorrow. It seems like complexity and, and the ability to MRV is only one aspect of the entire process that's under discussion, right? So it might be difficult to do the MRV, but it, the, the particular method may be much more effective or cheaper or, or safer or whatever. So it's not just the MRV is only one component, the one that we're discussing here of the entire process. So I, I think it's good to be open about our thoughts about the complexity and difficulty of the MRVing thing, but that doesn't necessarily predispose the entire choice of a one process over another or the importance of one over another, because so many other factors have to be considered as well. Ken Bissler from Woods Hole. Uh, I want to change direction. I want to get back to ecology and models. I have not heard a single thing about this. And, you know, if we're going to alter a system and, and preferentially uh, have more calcifiers, what does that do to the rest of the biological carbon pump, the other systems, and then further up the food chain? So do you agree? And we talked about there's not kelp in many of these models. You know, you're not modeling kelp directly. So does that mean we can't rely on models to look at ec ecological impacts? We have to measure that directly. Would you agree with that? And I guess the second part is, you know, how far have we come with models? Because we haven't seen any um, in terms of the extensive ecological impacts we might be uh, creating by doing any of these. 
we absolutely need to, need, need to measure first. Like the models are not magically giving us answers that they, they're not producing information where we have a void of knowledge, right? We need to observe to understand. And then the models are really helpful tools to sort of add value to observations in, in, in all the various ways, right? Um, that maybe maybe we sort of understand, maybe I didn't need to go in, into that. But there's uh, no, like um, um, the sort of thinking that a model will fill an, an information gap is, is a wrong notion in my opinion. So, so that models can somehow tell us about these unanticipated ecological um, behavior that might occur is, is foolish. We have to measure it so that we can parameter, we can inform the models um, and, and then they can produce additional value, but it's not the other way around. I, um, does that make sense? Well, I see Doug shaking his head, but yeah, no, I think it makes sense. Right? It seems like if it's an unknown process, it's unlikely to be parameterized in the model. <laughs> so, you know, what do you do? I mean, you know, so I think uh, inevitably, you know, our understanding, you know, uh, of fundamental processes still I think comes from observation and experimentation and we need to find the ways to do that on a scale that's relevant to this problem um, but you can't expect a model that doesn't have a process already built into it to tell tell us about it right so I think that's probably what you're getting at well it's almost worse like we know that selfs can have a big impact on carbon flux but that's not at any model episodic exactly. self event that can double the flux or increase the durability because it gets deeper. So we have known processes that we can't even put in models. So I think we just have to put that up front and say, we're only gonna get that through intensive observations, enhanced observations, and then start coming up with that list that we have to make as well for any of these MRVs. It's not just the ones that induce enhanced production, it's the ones that change chemistry, it's the ones that change physics, we'll all have ecological impacts that are not in models that we know will happen that need to be measured. I think that's the type of thing I'd like to see in the statement. Yeah, that, that, that's true. I, I would point out that that goes sort of in favor to Leonard's line of argumentation that um, the, the more steps we have in this chain of manipulation that we're trying to actually get to perform CDR for us, the more difficult it gets. <laughs> Well, right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Alex Gagne from University of Washington. Um, uh, this is continuing on the modeling and regional modeling sort of theme. When thinking about what models could achieve or, or um, where we could go with them and what's possible, I think it's useful to borrow from other fields or look at some of these examples. And so I'm going to plug an example here that I'm not involved with, but that uh, it comes from ocean acidification, where many in these room come from that I haven't heard brought up yet. And this is the live ocean model, um, which is a <clears throat> regional model that's high resolution, real time data simulation model that also makes forecasts for ocean chemistry in Puget Sound and Sailor Sea. And it's done with a fidelity, accuracy, and usefulness that commercial decisions are being made with this model. And you can access it on your cell phone. Um, and so, you know, shellfish uh, hatcheries decide when they're going to make commercial choices based on this. And so I think that's, um, uh, I think that's an important reference to look at, to think about what that could achieve, what something like that could achieve for us and where it falls short, but it is real and has been done um, and so it, we don't have to completely re reinvent the wheel with these sort of things. Hi, Grace Andrews Vesta. Um, that's really interesting. Um, I think I, I, I what's that? Oh, sorry, I missed it. Huh? I, you're fine. Good. <laughs> oh, you want to know my name again? It's Grace. <laughs> um, uh, I just want to um, take a step back slightly a little bit to what we were talking a few seconds ago. Um, I really, really, really think it's important to to not have discussions around like which of these um, CDR pathways are most promising right now for a lot of the great reasons that were brought up that it's complex much beyond MRV um, for other great reasons that were brought up about like we're still learning, right? Like most of these technologies have 
never actually been tried in the real world, right? Um, and I think everyone here knows that you can run all the model simulations all day long that you might ever dream up. And then when you try it in the field, a million new things pop up that, you know, show us some of the known, unknown unknowns, right? And so we really can't know until we try. And frankly, I think it's counterproductive to the climate crisis. Um, I, I think that it's silly to talk about like OAE is better than, you know, sargassum because OAE alone is not gonna fix the climate crisis. Um, if there are, if, if sargassum is more challenging, that's okay. If there's someone who is interested in taking on that challenge. Um, and we need people like that. We need people who are willing to take on these challenges. They're all, these are, they're all hard, right? Saying one's easier than the other. They're all really, really difficult. And um, we need to encourage people to be willing to take on the challenges and to be bold and, and to support them in these efforts because that's how we're, that's how we're gonna get out of this mess, so. But just, I mean, I think that said it nicely, you know, I mean, this is an urgent issue that we're, we're facing, you know, we don't, and we do have to keep an open mind and uh, to problems and possible solutions. And again, I think that also speaks to the structure of whatever, I, I'm gonna go on a lot about structures, sorry about that, but the, the, the approaches we develop for MRVing, whatever the, the target technology or approach is, have to be ideally transferable to others. You know, we really need to think about what fundamental sets of data, uh, data management approaches, data assimilation approaches, modeling approaches do we that covers the full spectrum of ideas because undoubtedly i think additional new ideas will come up six months from now or a year from now you know this is not the full set even of concepts that uh, it's just early days yet so we've got to come up with a, uh, a structure which can handle a variety of, of approaches of different levels of complexity seems sensible and i'll just add i actually really agree with your point um savvy clear path um, that everything needs to be worked on right now. I, I don't think we have the flexibility of picking and choosing which solutions make the most sense. And to me, um, the best part about, you know, all solutions is that they all have their own benefits. And in some ways, yes, the engineered solutions have a high cost and a high confidence level. And maybe something that is more natural does is a lower cost with uh, not more certainty, but I think the cost built in would be creating that certainty. That's where it's not currently captured. And I think this whole exercise would be able to increase the confidence we have in all solutions. So I don't think it's an either or, I think it's everything. Can I quickly, um, I wanna push back on that uh, a little bit because I mean, yes, uh, we should be optimistic and allow all ideas and stuff like that. But of, we, you, you know, we're not starting from zero. We have some knowledge here, in the a lot of knowledge in the room, and I think we need to apply this model to foresee, hey, what problems are we running into? And of course, I mean, the, the more complicated pathways. If we had a thousand years time, we could figure it out. But I mean, we have limited resources and time to 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 figure it out right so isn't it good to kind of i mean if you do a game plan right and and you have a mission to accomplish then you you choose a way that is most promising right and um at some point you got to make decisions on how to divert resources i'm not saying you shouldn't look at it but i'm saying you need to foresee it to some extent so i'm i mean optimi optimism yes and go for it yes but I mean, you got to figure some stuff out at some point, right? For yourself. I'm, I'm going to um, make one more comment here. I'm, I'm actually, I, I think, you know, if we're, if we're serious about this, I think we should be looking seriously at all these options. And I think that um, is a really good debate that we're having right now, by the way, I think it's really great. Um, uh, I just taking a step back and thinking about this from like a, a scientist point of view, like, we should also be thinking about, you know, the ways in which this is actually going to really inform the science that we're doing about the ocean. A lot of this focus has been on solutions. I think that's really great, but um, we don't know a lot about the biological carbon pump. 
we don't know a lot about the alkalinity cycle in the ocean. Like there are things that I think we can really learn scientifically, like this is a path forward for us to potentially close the carbon budget, right? Um, and I think we should be thinking about these avenues of research. I mean, in some sense, yes, we all want to make a difference. We all want to uh, solve this climate crisis, but we have a we have a shot by doing these field trials and doing these experiments to really understand things about the global carbon cycle that we we just don't know, right? We're going to close knowledge gaps here, and um, that could lead to other solutions uh, that we don't even know about yet. Um, so I. Yeah, I think I think that's just an important thing to keep in mind. There's the the science to industry connection, but there's also the benefit that we're getting out of this for, for, for doing ocean science. And we shouldn't lose that sight. So I want to redirect everybody into thinking there has to be a balance in this community between optimization and failure. Just because things look like they don't work right now doesn't mean we won't figure out how to make them work in the future. Um, and on that delightful Nobel Prize winning note. I'm cutting off the conversation because we have to move to the next thing. Uh, Heather, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so that was a really impressive discussion. Um, probably one of the most lively we had. I, we, we actually questioned and answered through our break. So it's coming up on 1030 now and we have a new addition today and I'm not sure if Jason Greer has arrived yet. He is right here from the EPA. He was gonna talk to us a little bit about permitting and CDR, which I know that this came up a lot on day one. And I think a lot of people in this room are really curious about that. I'm gonna suggest that we go to break for- Oh, there it is. That's what I'm looking for right here. Oh, great. So I'll make that big. Yeah, and then there's, I'll open up another Yep. Window here. Okay. Um, and I will start your timer. Yeah, start it on the summary one. Yep. Will do. And I recommend going around this way so you don't, so you don't trip. I recommend walking around this okay. way so you don't trip. Uh, All right, you're ready to go. So just click your other tab when you're ready. And you can leave it as is when you're done. I'll time you in a couple minutes. So please. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. We recognize that that was a short break. Um, we are running about 15 minutes behind on our schedule, and so I want to get us back on track as much as we can. Um, for right now, uh, we're really lucky to have been able to organize a visit for one of our colleagues uh, at the EPA, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, what the permitting process for CDR projects looks like. So Jason, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jason Greer. I'm, I work at the uh, EPA's Atlantic Coastal Environmental Sciences Division, um, which is right next door. Big seawater lab over there, chemistry labs, all of that. And that is part of EPA's Office of Research and Development which maintains a very bright line, a, bright, a strong separation from the regulatory parts of the agency. We do science that supports regulatory policy, decision-making and so on. So I'm actually required to stay clear of talking about any sort of like specific permit requirements for the kinds of projects that you guys are doing or thinking about. Um, feels a little bit out of scale with this kind of the size of the ideas that are Going, you know, being discussed this week to, to be getting into permits, but I just wanted to help, you know, you got to start somewhere, as somebody said a few minutes ago. Um, so I'm actually going to, I just, this just came up yesterday that I would be over here. So I just threw together some notes and I'm going to actually end up just kind of following my notes. Um, so uh, let's see. So some of the, the relevant legislation that comes to mind, um, and again, this is the kind of thing that you would find in your own search. I, I really am not an expert on permitting. I'm you know, just a basic scientist, but I do interact with the people that make these decisions. And I've learned a little bit about 
the permitting issues that might come up in the context of MCDR. So this is what's known as the Ocean Dumping Act, um, the, the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act. And a couple of things that I've just recently learned about this um, are in these bullets in that first paragraph. Um, transportation of material from the United States for the purpose of ocean dumping. And by ocean dumping, it just means putting stuff in the ocean. It doesn't matter what it is. So these are things that are prohibited. And what that means is they're prohibited without a permit. Um, the, so that means that any material, it doesn't matter where it's going, it could be going to you know, the Indian Ocean or something. If it's coming from the US, it, requi it apparently requires these kinds of permits. Um, transportation from anywhere for the purpose of ocean dumping uh, by US agencies or US flag vessels um, or material from outside the US coming into US territorial waters. Um, so these uh, permit reviews require certain kinds of data that I think would probably probably be good to know about in the context of the discussion that you're having this week. Um, and uh, another example of a relevant piece of legislation would be something like a, a Clean Water Act permit for like the electrolysis projects that are being considered. So that's more of a discharge rather than, than a dumping activity. Um, where a lot of the activity, my understanding is a lot of activity under this dumping act has been around dredging, dredging of, you know, for, of navigation channels and the dumping of that material into ocean dumping sites. And the EPA regions around the country, the regional offices, of which there are 10 of different regions of the country, do the monitoring. So each region has a chief scientist that's in charge of monitoring those dump sites. And they have a lot of data requirements, um, you know, data quality objectives and that kind of thing, many of which actually can be found in these links. So if you go to this ocean dumping link, um, there are, uh, let's see, you get down here, you see these headings for national guidance, regional guidance. These get into things like data quality objectives or the kinds of data that would be needed to review an activity were it to be subject to this you know per kind of permit requirement um and again there may be other pieces of legislation i want to give you um two contacts you got your pencil ready These, i talked to folks in the office of water yesterday and they said yes please share our contact information tell the workshop any one of them can call us and ask us questions about these potential regulatory implications so one of them is Betsy Valenti, that's V-A-L-E-N-T-E dot B-E-T-S-Y at EPA dot gov. And the other one is Redford dot David, uh, that's R-E-D-F-O-R-D dot David at EPA dot gov. They both know, they're aware of the workshop happening this week and have already started thinking about some of these issues. And those folks both know a lot about these regulatory programs that I've mentioned. Um, I also just wanted to, uh, I served on um, the interagency working group for ocean acidification for about, I'm still some participate somewhat, but was more active in its early years. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm a, I, I do a lot of carbonate chemistry. I'm more of an ecologist. My focus is on, on the ecological implications. But um, through that experience with the IWG, I, I did learn some things about the, the benefits of, of coordination between agencies and between the research community and the agencies that are responsible for making decisions about these kinds of activities. Um, one of those lessons is that, you know, as, as was just discussed a minute ago, this, this kind of activity, activity offers an opportunity to learn a lot about the ocean. You know, I always think of iron fertilization as a great example of that, of how much we learned about the oceans through that work, even though it was largely motivated by an interest in, you know, geoengineering our way out of, of our climate predicament. But um, my feeling about the research that has ensued in response to the Foram Act is that 
it's been valuable for most most of its the strengths of the research that has come out of it has been more around the sort of large marine ecosystem kinds of questions, fisheries management kinds of questions, which is you know one of the mandates of of that NOAA has for that kind of work. But my feeling is that the, the progress towards developing the kinds of biological response indicators that would be helpful for decision making under some of these regulatory programs has been pretty slow to develop. Um, that's partly why I'm doing the kind of work that I do at the lab next door. But of course, what I can do with my small group isn't going to cut it. Um, so that's just sort of a, a, a lesson in hindsight that, that I wanted to share about that process of, of um, trying to help develop research implementation strategies and that kind of thing. Um, let's see. So the, the one other thing I wanted to offer is um, there's a lot of policy, at least around decision around um, nutrient enrichment in the coastal environment that centers on dissolved oxygen and the effects of nutrient enrichment, you know, the, 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 the eutrophication response to, to nutrient enrichment. And um, there's a sort of a nice history of the science that has developed and, and how that science has informed policy um, research on dissolved oxygen and its impacts on aquatic life goes back, of course, a hundred years. And if, I, I, I would like to offer that as, as, as a one place you might start to see how um, the science on biological responses to human activity can inform, in that case, decisions under the Clean Water Act. Um, but you know, if you start cruising the websites at EPA, you'll see things like guidance documents on the kinds of data that are needed, what kinds of, you know, how are organisms chosen for developing biological indicators? You know, are they chosen to represent a suite of, of, of phyla? That kind of thing, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a pretty useful history to look at. Um, so that was all I was gonna say, um, but happy to try to answer questions if I can. Oh, waiting for a mic. I, I get it. Yeah. Hey, Savvy from ClearPath. Quick question. Does EPA plan on or anticipate that they will publish any sort of guidance in the future on each sort of pathway and who the regulatory sort of agencies should be that they're collaborating with or talking to? That's, um, I guess all I can really say to that is I know that they're, they're, Using the dissolved oxygen example, there is published guidance, and and the, the, the guidance I'm most familiar with is the one for the Virginia province, you know, north of Cape Hatteras. So we have a guidance document that informs and establishes, does, you know, target dissolved oxygen levels. Um, and I would hope that the th same kind of thing might develop in response to these kinds of projects. I haven't seen anything like that in the ocean and coastal acidification realm yet. But even the term guidance is something that has a very specific and technical meaning to EPA. And even talking about that is something I have to be careful about. Yeah. I wanna emphasize that I have absolutely no authority to answer this question. I have no authority to answer this question. Um, but uh, uh, consolidation products like that are something that uh, uh, gets brought up in the community a lot. We want to simplify the regulatory pathways as much as we can in order to accelerate the permitting process, right? It's been in the national news a little bit recently, which you may or may not have been paying attention to. Um, so there are some precedents for products like that, like the one that Jason just uh, brought up. I'll emphasize that there is an aquaculture permitting portal that's developed both in Maine um, and one in Alaska. And in fact, industry likes the one in Alaska so much that they called California and said, please make that. Um, I don't know whether or not they're going to do it, <laughs> uh, uh, but I do know that uh, those are the kinds of products that are currently being developed. Um, Nate, how are we doing on time before we get extensively into discussion? 
three minutes. Oh, thank you. Great. Heather, I'm, I'm going to hang around too. So great. Please do. I know a lot of people in a break or something. <laughs> a lot of people will want to talk with you. Um, I just want to note that um, Hetty piped up earlier and Guillaume shared this link earlier too. So there is a link from this site with specific guidelines on CDR. And I've pasted the information from that along with the link into the participant notes so you can all get after it. And then John Crucius from USGS. Um, one could make a compelling argument that the burning of fossil fuels is a form of ocean dumping and that it leads to ocean acidification. Yet we allow that without permitting. It's grandfathered into our society. How can we recognize this and factor this into any legislation addressing ocean CDR? We should not be asked to compare ocean CDR impacts to those of a 1600 AD pristine ocean. Yeah, uh, Greg Rao, Planetary. Um, you made a distinction between discharge and dumping. Is there a distinction and what is it and what's the difference? Yeah, that's already, sorry, that's out of my realm. I mean, common sense would suggest it's, uh, oh no. That's another thing I'm told not to do. Don't start a sentence in government with, well, you would think, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I really got to stay away from that one. But it, uh, if, if you leave a note for me, I will chase down an answer for you and get back to you. I will, uh, or maybe ask David Redford or one of those folks to get back to you. Um, yeah, Adam Sabash from Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, do you, maybe you can't say anything about this either, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering about the difference uh, that the EPA um, puts on um, projects that are specifically for research and projects that are um, associated with a, a financial interest like a company. Um, and uh, are the, again, you probably can't say anything about the pathways or anything, but I'm just wondering, you know, is there a line there and, and uh, what do we do about that? I'm not aware of any difference like that. I think the questions would be the same whether it's research, whether it's an actual like implementation of CDR, whether it's a, you know, a short-term study of CDR. I think the, in terms of like who it's coming from, I don't think that that's a relevant question. Um, I know from my experience in other regulatory programs, which I can speak about, I, I once worked in a brief stint in a state regulatory program. And um, there were sometimes different uh, review processes for projects that were being done by government, um, different kinds of permit requirements, that kind of thing. So that might be one example. But also from that regulatory experience, I can point out that these kinds of, like what's the difference between discharge and dumping? You know, I can, the example I just used in the hallway over here, um, that program I worked in for the state of Connecticut was a structures, dr structures dredging and fill program and under that program you couldn't build a sand castle on the beach without a permit so um that's why i'm afraid of even like trying to dance around that gray line i, I just don't know what kind of logic it's used to separate them so jason's going to stick around for a little bit and we're grateful for him being a conduit to the rest of the epa community thanks. for us all right um, thanks everyone We're heading into lightning talks. Uh, I think I'm first, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm just going to come around. I told you I was doing it. Um, a lot of you uh, have been either formally or informally aware that Noah has been working on a draft CDR research strategy. Um, we wrote it and it's on the internet and now you can read it. Scan the QR code. Um, the, uh, uh, there's going to be a public review process. Right now we're sort of in a private external review phase, uh, but we did actually publish the document on the internet. It has four parts. The first part just uh, uh, talks about a federal motivation for CDR research specific to our agency. 
After that is a very, very brief review of CDR techniques and science. If you are looking for the extensive review of that science, please reference the National Academies report. The third part is a synopsis for NOAA's key assets for CDR research. Uh, and then after that is a vision of how we think we might push that research going forward. Um, uh, for me, this table that I'm about to show you really encapsulates that, uh, uh, those assets uh, for NOAA research at the agency. So the first part is obviously NOAA runs these massive observing networks. Tuning these observing networks to the needs of the CDR community has been something that's brought, been brought up multiple times at this research or at this workshop. And we have some ideas of what the outcomes of that might look like and how we might do that that's in the report. Same thing for the Earth System Modeling Community that's based at NOAA, right? But also, NOAA's got some facets at the agency that really focus on environmental impacts uh, and understanding what the ecosystem research, again, not necessarily the ecosystem governance, but the ecosystem research uh, that needs to be done to correlate with some of these studies. Um, and then as well, thinking about ocean planning considerations. So those decision support tools that we were just talking about, like the permitting portals, you know, NOAA's contributed to that permitting portal uh, for the state of Alaska. And those are the kinds of the decision support products that we think we might be um, uh, 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 apt to make in the future or well-equipped to make in the future. There are flyers uh, that talk about this uh, in the hall out on the table next to the name tags. Um, I encourage you to take a flyer. There are two versions, one that has methods of CDR on the back. This is just a subset of what's in the report and one that has the table. I know this text is too small for you to read. I don't expect you to read it. That's why I just tried to summarize the four blocks. Um, and then of course, click on the QR code. It's also on the flyers in the bottom right-hand corner of both sides. Thanks. All right, um, I'm Tyler Stiernak. I'm starting a new position at Georgia Southern University. So coral reefs are great. They provide lots of uh, ecosystem services. 30% of marine species live there at some point, 300 billion plus dollars in various things, storm protection, food, they are great ecosystems, but one thing they're not good at is taking carbon out of the atmosphere. In fact, they're not included in blue carbon um, ecosystems because of the thing that makes them so great, which is calcification, because that actually reduces the ability of oceans to take up CO2. Um, and how that works is really evident in these sort of alkalinity versus dissolving organic carbon graphs, which you can see here, so total alkalinity. On the y-axis, carbon on the um, x-axis, and then in the background is shaded PCO2. So you can use this sort of vector analysis to think about how perturbations to the carbon system is going to impact your ability to take up carbon. So just theoretically, if we add alkalinity to the ocean, you go up in this direction and we increase the ability to absorb CO2, right? So we're going to try and re-equilibrate back to where we started. And that vector there is the carbon that we're taking up in the ocean. If we do calcification, we actually reduce that ability and we go down there. And somewhere along that line is where it's gonna re-equilibrate to where we do the calcification and sort of we lose efficiency as we go down, but we're still taking up carbon well below the point where we're actually adding the alkalinity to the point where we add the alkalinity, it goes from about 0.8 to 0.5 per mole of alkalinity of carbon we take up. So this is all theoretical, and um, but based in our, our very good understanding of the carbon system, but how does this pertain to ocean alkalinity enhancement or CDR in general, and how can coral reefs or coastal ecosystems in general potentially enhance our capacity to do MRV and CDR? So this is actual data from coral uh, reef incubation. So this was led by Alyssa Griffin from UC Davis. And basically what we did is took these little incubation chambers out and we added alkalinity. This was done in 2018. It really was not intended as a CDR approach. We just were trying to change the pH in the opposite direction of ocean acidification in an experiment, trying to understand how that impacts calcification in these sediments. And so what you see here is the same alkalinity DIC graph. And the incubations are averages of three from both alkalinity additions and just control chambers. So we went from our control chamber to adding alkalinity at the start right there. We come down in our alkalinity addition, we calcified down to that point. 
And then that's where we went with the control. So that difference between there is CDR potential, right? And really, I, I want to ask the question here is, does this help MRV? Because now we know where that alkalinity is stored over long time periods. It's stored on coral reefs where alkalinity is stored for thousands and thousands of years, you know, potentially leading to some things like um, large scale CO2 cycles in the atmosphere. And I showed you a pretty picture of a coral reef, but coral reefs are really mostly sediment. So this is what it looks like. And just sort of an idea thinking about coastal ecosystems. Whoops. We need to think about coastal ecosystems. And Eric, you can turn on your camera when you're ready. Hi, can you see me and hear me? Let me bring you to the front over here. Are we ready to go? Uh, just one second. Actually, why don't you go ahead with audio and we'll not worry about camera at the moment. Sure. Thanks everyone for having me virtually. My name's Eric Siegel. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at the Ocean Frontier Institute. And uh, OFI is based at Dalhousie University in Halifax and facilitates frontier ocean science and climate science to inform global industry and policy. Uh, that's the right slide, perfect. And to enable more CDR research and to more rapidly scale climate mitigation through CDR, we need to bring projects out of labs, beakers, and tanks and into larger venues. OFI and our partners are developing two initiatives to facilitate larger scale science observations and innovative MRV methods, a living lab in Bedford Basin and the North Atlantic Carbon Observatory. So Bedford Basin is located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's close to Dalhousie University, Bedford Institute of Oceanography, and easily accessible by plane or electric vehicle to the rest of the world. Bedford has a direct connection to the ocean and represents an excellent living lab opportunity. And the panel this morning spoke about the importance of regional links to basin processes. It's been very well observed and modeled by many local partners that you see at the bottom of the screen and also in your audience today, of course, uh, dating back a few decades. And for example, Katja spoke today about her high resolution numerical model of the area. The goal is to develop a pre-permitted test site that international researchers and companies can come to and test CDR and MRV methodologies without exhaustive paperwork, likely focusing on OAE first. Uh, next slide, please. So the North Atlantic is the world's most intense carbon sink, accounting for 30% of all carbon dioxide that the oceans absorb. And in collaboration with our partners at the bottom of this page, we're pulling nations together to launch the North Atlantic Carbon Observatory or NACO. So why NACO? There's a critical need to better understand the ocean and changing ocean climate processes to forecast and mitigate climate change. And we know more accurate climate forecasts will enable better global climate policy and more connected observations and basin scale MRV hopefully will enable improved CDR development, scale up investments, and hopefully carbon credit sales, but most importantly impact, which is what we're all working for. We're aiming to accomplish this by linking up individual national observing programs across the North Atlantic and process studies such as the Hui Vital Science Program. And we'll determine where critical ocean carbon observations are missing, and try to fill these gaps with new long-term observations and new process studies. And so for more information about NACO, please go to ofi.ca slash NACO or scan this QR code. And this QR code will lead to a one hour ocean carbon workshop, which OFI is facilitating uh, next week. It's Wednesday, October 5th at 7 a.m. Eastern time. So bring your coffee and join us virtually. You can scan that QR code or you can Email me for Zoom registration details. Thank you. Thank you. I have to look at our schedule. I don't remember. <laughs> All right, breakout groups. You guys are pros now. You're just jumping up. <laughs> yep.